I'm Greg Pretty, a senior fellow at the Center for the National Interest, and we have with us today Dr. Raz Zemt. He's an expert on Iran at the Institute for National Security Studies in Israel. He also is a research fellow at the Alliance Center for Iranian Studies at Tel Aviv University. His main interests are the politics, foreign relations, society, and social media of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, we're going to be discussing, uh, you know, some obviously very important questions surrounding the nexus between Iran and the war which fo followed the her Hamas terrorist attack in Israel. Um, what is the nature of ties between Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah? How does Iran perceive its interests in it here? Um, does Iran view Hezbollah as a deterrent against Israeli action against its nuclear program, or has that uh, has that view and that relationship changed? And of course, how, how all this plays into the prospects for either containment or escalation of the current conflict in Gaza. Uh, Raz, I'll let you uh, lead off here with uh, introductory remarks. Thank you, Greg. Good morning to you all and good afternoon from, from Israel. It's uh, nice to be in today. Thank you for the invitation despite the, the difficult times today. Uh, let me start by saying just a few words about two main issues I'm, I'm kept being asked over the last 11 days since, since the war erupted uh, here in Israel and in Gaza, uh, concerning the linkage uh, or the Iranian involvement in, in what's going on in, in, in Israel and in Gaza right now. Uh, the first issue, which I personally find uh, to be less important right now, but uh, I have to say a few words about that, uh, was the, the the extent of Iranian involvement in the in Hamas attack itself, and and the, as you probably know, that there were a few versions uh, in in the U.S. outlets, and in, including from uh, uh, statements coming from from Washington and Jerusalem as well, concerning the, the extent of Iranian uh, involvement in, in this issue. And I have to say that the, the, some of the confusion uh, over the, the, the level of Iranian involvement, in my view, stems from, the, from a certain mis misunderstanding concerning the dynamics between Iran and, and the Hamas. And, and I think, uh, and I say that from, from, from day one, uh, I, I think uh, one should distinguish between two, two kinds of Iranian involvement. Uh, one kind of, of involvement is, is the ongoing Iranian support, uh, delivery of technology, of, of weapon, of, of, of know-how, uh, of mythology, uh, how to work, uh, of other capabilities, uh, which is a, a known fact that the Iranians have never tried to hide that. And certainly, I, I, it's very clear to me, and I think it's, it should be clear to anyone, that Hamas could not have carried out this attack without Iranian support and Iranian assistance. So that, that, that's one part of, of the issue. In, in addition, uh, there have certainly been uh, numerous coordinations taking place between uh, Iran and the other components, other members of the so-called axis of resistance over the last year, uh, even two years, mainly between the Hamas, the PIJ, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, and the Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guards, mostly in Beirut and Damascus, including in recent weeks. And uh, as, uh, it's very clear that they've got operational issues. So I, I cannot, certainly I cannot rule out the possibility that one of the issues raised in those uh, uh, talks was this upcoming uh, attack carried out by, by Hamas. But I do think that it's important to distinguish between this kind of, of, uh, of support given by Iran to, to Hamas and the issue of, of command and control. Uh, and that has, uh, and this is something different. I don't think that Hamas uh, had to ask for Iran's permission. The relationship between Hamas and Iran, and we can uh, discuss it later on, is, is more pro problematic. It's not, uh, it's not that Ismail Haniyeh in Qatar or, uh, um, or Iranian leadership in uh, Yahya al-Sawar, uh, the leader in Gaza, has to wait for a phone call from, from the IRGC commander or from Ismail Fahani, the commander of the IRGC Quds, and get his permission to, to do what he wants to do. Uh, the issue is Palestinian, the interests are Palestinians, the interests of, of, of those of the Hamas. The timing was probably decided by the Hamas, but there are certainly uh, overlap interests between Iran and the Hamas, which uh, played a role in, in, in even in the timing of, of this attack. So that's that's one issue. Uh, again, it's it's important issue, but in my opinion, it's it's the, the most the more important issue right now 
is to see what Iran has been doing since the attack, whether it was surprised by this attack or, or, or being more involved in the attack. And uh, my sense is that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't always believe what the Iranian officials are saying, but this time I have to say, I, I truly believe to what uh, uh, Iran's foreign minister, uh, Hossein Amir Abdul Hayyan, uh, has repeatedly said over the last few days, including in his, in his very lengthy interview given to the Iranian TV last night. And he said, we, we would like a ceasefire. We would like to put an end to, to what's going on in Gaza. And, and, and I tend to, to believe that. I think that the best scenario for, for Iran was to have a ceasefire not today, not tomorrow, but a week ago. Uh, that was the point where Israel suffered a, a major, uh, uh, major defeat. Uh, and the best scenario for Iran was to stop the confrontation before Hamas has to pay uh, any any more prices, before Hezbollah has to pay prices, uh, and just to stop it. The problem for Iran is that that that's not going to happen. And so what what we we have seen, especially over the last twenty four hours, was on the one hand and uh, one hand more and more diplomatic um, talks between Iranian officials, mostly. Uh, Abdullayan and uh, and his colleagues around the world to try and 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 call for a ceasefire. And what we've also seen is uh, growing threats uh, heard by Iranian officials. Abdullayan yesterday, uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei this morning, uh, the commander of the Revolutionary Guard this uh, this this morning as well, saying if Israel continues what it's doing in Gaza. Uh, we will have no other choice but to use the axis of resistance to, uh, 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 to to carry out further attacks against against Israel. Now, uh, I have to say uh, that, uh, from my point of view, uh, that, that some of those statements uh, don't don't necessarily mean that Iran is going. Well, certainly doesn't mean that Iran is going to be directly involved in uh, some kind of retaliation in, uh, against Israel. As we all know, Iran is, is usually uh, preferred to work through uh, the so-called proxies or partners or, or, or its allies in the region, uh, whether it's Hamas or Hezbollah or its pro-Iranian ministries. So I still believe that uh, it's, it's very unlikely, unless something dramatic happens, that we will see a direct uh, a military uh, response from Iran against Israel. The, the, the question is what will what uh, what what will be the point in which Iran uh, considers to engage Hezbollah in a full scale war against Israel and and what we've seen including in the last few minutes is growing tensions in in the north between Israel and Hezbollah but this is still restricted it's still limited it's certainly not uh, a full scale confrontation between Iran and Hezbollah and the question is what will happen and when it will happen that Iran decides to put all its efforts to try and, 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 and put more pressure on Hezbollah to use its capabilities uh, against Israel. Uh, I personally don't think that even if Israel decides to begin the so-called ground, uh, um, the ground campaign in Gaza, that by itself might not be considered by Iran as a red line. I mean, they, they could try to escalate things a little further, perhaps using the pro-Iranian militias in Syria and Iraq, perhaps, uh, letting Hezbollah do more than it's doing right now, but I think the decision will will be made by by, by Iran at the, at a certain point when the Israeli activities and the Israeli operation in Gaza uh, uh, poses a real threat to the mere stability of of, uh, of Hamas, its ability to maintain itself as the sovereign in in Gaza, uh, meaning uh, that its political political leadership or most of its political leadership is going to be uh, to become targets of Israeli offensive. Uh, if 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 the Hamas loses the most of its strategic uh, weapons capabilities, this will be the point where, in my view, Iran is going to face a very difficult dilemma. Because that it will have to choose between two options. One is bad, and the other is even worse. The bad, uh, the bad option will be okay. We we uh, we let Israel continue what it's doing in Gaza. Uh, perhaps again some pressure on Hezbollah or pro-Iranian militias to to uh, further to put further pressure on Israel. But that will allow Israel to continue its efforts against Hamas. It will certainly show the weakness of the axis of resistance. And the Iranian narrative of the convergence of the front uh, will uh, will suffer a, a major blow. So that's that's one bad option for Iran. 
The other option, which in my view could be even worse, is that Iran will have to sacrifice the uh, strategic capabilities of Hezbollah for the sake of the Palestinians and to try and save uh, Hamas. The problem with that is that, first of all, it will expose Hezbollah to further uh, pressure by not just by, by Israel, but also perhaps by the United States. And uh, uh, it, 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 will, uh, it, it might mean that at this point, Iran could actually use not just Hamas, but its most important strategic uh, arm, Hezbollah in Lebanon, which has been considered uh, for many years by Iran to be its, its most important deterrent force uh, against, against Israel. Uh, I will just end up with, with saying one, one word about the, uh, about the conception. Uh, we all discussed the, the collapse of the Israeli conception when it comes to Hamas over the last few, few, uh, few days. Uh, I think it's important to remember that the, the fact that one conception has collapsed doesn't necessarily mean that all conceptions are 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 are, are foiled. But I, I would like to address to, to to say a few words about another conception. We we and, and I I shared I have shared this this conception for for the last few years, and this is the conception in Israel and not just in Israel, which says that uh, actually Hezbollah was uh, was designed by Iran to serve as its deterrence. And, and also as a retaliation against Israeli uh, possible attack against Iran's nuclear facilities. So when, when this day comes, Iran will be able to use Hezbollah to retaliate to Israeli uh, uh, nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear facility attack. I, I still share the, this view. I still think, as I said, that it seems to me not very likely that Iran will would like to sacrifice Hezbollah for the sake of Hamas, but just but two things have happened: one for the last uh, year or two, and the other one recently, which makes me a little more uh, um, uh, uh, more modest concerning this conception. One is the fact that Iran has practically become a threat of nuclear state, and in my view, that means that uh, uh, the, the Iranian concern from a possible Israeli military attack against uh, nuclear facilities in Iran, unless, of course, Iran decides to break out nuclear weapons, which seems quite unlikely at this point. Uh, this concern has, has, has not diminished, but has certainly decreased. So there is a possibility that Iran will reach the conclusion, look, uh, Israel is not going to attack is, uh, Iranian nuclear facilities uh, anytime uh, soon. So we might uh, be able to, to use Hezbollah in order to attack Israel. The second thing, which is uh, more immediate, is of course uh, that this will be the first time uh, since Hamas took uh, control of Gaza, in which there is a real threat to uh, to the existence of Hamas as the ruler, as the sovereign in Gaza, and that might in, uh, inflict uh, uh, huge damage not just to Hamas itself, but also to the ability of Iran and the resistant uh, front to continue uh, uh, and preserve its interests. So again, if, if two or three years ago, I would say there is no way Iran will, will, would like to so-called waste the Hezbollah uh, capabilities for the sake of Hamas or to save Hamas, that's, that might, might no longer be the case because until now, uh, the, the severest uh, uh, um, uh, scenario for Iran was a weakened Hamas, uh, which they could rehabilitate. Today, if they are facing a possibility of collapse of Hamas, that might uh, uh, urge Iran to take a different position. Uh, I will stop here. So, uh, you know, the first question I'd, I'd throw at you, I think this is a pretty simple one. I take away from what you're saying that you're, you're thinking that their threshold status as a, as a threshold nuclear power, they're already getting some geopolitical benefit from that in terms of being freer to act in the region. Um, and not needing that non-nuclear deterrent to deter action against it. Is that, is that what you were getting at? I'm getting the point that, that if, if for, for years Iran uh, needed, required Hezbollah in order to be its, uh, first of all, to deter Israel from attacking Iran, and then if Israel decides to attack, then to retaliate to Hezbollah, I think that by now, uh, look, Iran has been enriching uranium to 60%. Israel has done nothing. 
uh, Iran is two weeks away, less than two weeks away, away from a decision to break out if it wants to do that and to reduce uranium to 90%. Israel has, been, has done nothing. If you listened recently to Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech in, in the UN uh, General Assembly, he talked about Iran, but he mostly talked about Saudi Arabia. He said almost nothing about Iran's nuclear uh, facility. So if I were an Iranian, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so uh, concerned with the possibility of Israeli military attack. And in this scenario, perhaps I, I could uh, uh, allow Hezbollah to so-called waste some of his uh, assets uh, for the sake of Hamas, which I, I couldn't afford myself to do a few years ago. Yeah, in my view has been that their their threshold state status has been more or less de facto accepted by the White House and to, to a lesser extent by Israel. But you know, the fact that their oil exports have been increasing and we haven't been tightening sanctions and we appear to have gotten a little bit of forbearance from them on slowing down the rate of expansion. Um, yeah, I wrote a piece about that recently. It looks, looks suspicious. This is kind of, a, it, for some of our listeners, this may be an obvious question, but for, for others, it wouldn't be. Can you talk a little bit about just uh, Hezbollah capabilities and what they could bring to bear um, and how that compares to what Hamas has been doing? Yeah, so uh, over the last uh, 10, 11 days, most of the discussion in, in, uh, in Israel and abroad was about uh, the so-called Radwan uh, uh, force, which is the equivalent of uh, the Nukbe uh, uh, special force of Hamas, which infiltrated into Israel and took control of Israeli uh, settlements near, uh, uh, near, near the border. Uh, but I have to say that this uh, conventional ground forces uh, and the ability of the Hezbollah to use its special forces to infiltrate into Israel and take control over Israeli uh, bitim and, and, and villages near, near the border seems to me quite uh, irrelevant right now due to the fact that it has lost the surprise element. And uh, the level of Israeli reserves being uh, deployed right now in the north cannot allow Hezbollah to do that. So that remains, uh, main, uh, that leaves us with the most significant and severe uh, um, challenge or threat by Hezbollah, and that's the, the, uh, the, the, the firepower. Uh, Iran, is, sorry, sorry, Hezbollah uh, has accumulated more than 100 thousands of rockets, uh, which by itself is a, it's a huge uh, challenge to the security of Israel. But in addition to the so-called regular rockets over the last few years due to Iranian uh, uh, efforts, despite Israeli efforts to, to try and, and hinder this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Hezbollah has probably got uh, at least a few hundreds of precise uh, rockets. Now, uh, again, with all due respect to Israeli air defense and its ability to deal with that, uh, that might uh, um, get a very significant damage uh, both to the Israeli uh, home front and also to some of the uh, more sensitive uh, military and civilian infrastructure inside Israel. Now, I have to be very clear. It's, it's not that Israel cannot deal with, with two fronts. Uh, the, the, the scenario of Israel have to deal with, with more than one front is a scenario which the IDF has, has, has framed for over the last few years. But the meaning of, of a new front for Israel could actually mean that uh, Israel will have to uh, to divide its uh, both its air force capabilities and its ground forces between two main uh, challenges: one in south and one in in, this, in the north. And that, of course, puts more constraints uh, on, on Israel. And that, of course, besides the, the the heavy price the Israeli uh, civilians uh, and the home front will have to to, to pay uh, because of this huge arsenal of rockets uh, Hezbollah has. I, it's it's unfortunate, but just you know the proliferation of pre precision guidance, Iran and many other uh, fourth-rate powers can now do a lot of the things that the U.S. wowed everyone with back in the first Gulf War. That kind of level of accuracy, um, you know, I've heard the Fighter One Ten missile system, to, you know, is all similar to the U.S. Atakam system that everyone's talking about with Ukraine, um, and from the accuracy that they displayed, probably not as accurate but almost comparable, um, you know, in what they've been able to achieve in their strike against the U.S. bases in Iraq uh, and also that strike that they made against Islamic really. State elements, which was kind of, I think that the strike in Syria was kind of demonstrated to show the U.S. exactly how accurate they were since they had U.S. forces uh, there. 
Uh, and, and also, and also, of course, the the, the Iranian uh, attack against Saudi Arabia in, in September yeah. of 2019, which, which I, I've talked and written quite a bit about that. I mean, that was it was a demonstration of capability, but they essentially pulled their punch to stay below Trump's retaliation threshold. Right. Because, you know, as, as the oil analyst in me, and I've done a lot of work with the industry, understands that it runs well under capacity. So all you would need to do is hit triple the number of aim points on that, and then you would actually have an economic problem. Um, and that's kind of one deterrent that Iran has in their back pocket that I don't think is likely to become an issue in this crisis. Um, but it, it could be if you reach the sort of maximum escalation that, that I, I don't think either of us expect is, is all, that, um, right. all that likely. One other question, you know, going from Lebanon to Syria, you have, um, you know, the Bashar al-Assad regime is pretty firmly ensconced at this point, and you have Iranian uh, IRGC personnel, many of them in Syria. Is there any way that, I mean, obviously that's involved as part of this second front, does that have any escalation risks itself outside the region, outside yeah, the immediate battle? So, certainly. And, and by the way, I think that uh, it's more likely to, if we speak about uh, further escalation uh, down the road, this will be something that I will be looking for. Because again, if, if Iran really doesn't want to spend, to, to, to waste the capabilities of Hezbollah, uh, because it's it's very much concerned with the possibility of losing Hezbollah or much of Hezbollah's capabilities uh, for the sake of Hamas, it could certainly use its pro-Iranian militias in, in, in Iraq and Syria. And by the way, uh, according to the statements given uh, over the last 24 hours, uh, Abdullayan, for example, yesterday said, when, when we speak about resistance in the, in the region, we don't necessarily speak about Hezbollah. We can speak about other elements of the resistance in the region. And this morning, the spokesman of, of uh, Iran's foreign ministry uh, said it as well. Uh, uh, he said, uh, look, the, the access of resistance uh, is not restricted just to one front, meaning mostly Hezbollah. It has other fronts. So my concern is that, yes, if, 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 if for example, Israel decides to, to, uh, to, to continue with its uh, 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 warfare and then go to the ground operation, uh, perhaps the next stage for Iran might be the use of pro-Iranian militias using drones, using uh, rockets, either from Syria or from Western Iraq or by the Houthi from, from Yemen. Again, it, uh, in my, it, it won't make uh, a, much, uh, a huge impact on the ability of the IVF to deal with that. I mean, with all due respect to the pro-Iranian militias in Syria or in Iraq, that, that's not Hezbollah. It's, it's not even Hamas. But it will certainly put uh, further restraints uh, on what the IDF can, can deal with. And if I understand you correctly, that kind of activity on a modest scale would probably not prompt Israel to go to do anything directly against Iran outside of Syria. So my sense is that the mood right now in Israel is certainly not to do anything directly against Iran and even try to not to open up uh, a new front against, against Lebanon. There are some voices in Israel uh, um, saying, well, perhaps we should use this opportunity as a way to redesign uh, our, uh, our, the, the Middle East, not just in Gaza, but also in Lebanon and perhaps even to deal with the nuclear facilities. I, I don't get the, 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 um, the, the sense that that's going to happen. I think that most Israeli um, officials, most Israeli military um, elements uh, still believe that the most important and most immediate uh, uh, objective right now is to make sure that we will not uh, uh, have Hamas as our neighbor. To, 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 I wouldn't say to eliminate Hamas because Hamas is much more than a political or, or, or military organization, but to um, make sure that Hamas cannot uh, continue to be the sovereign in, in Gaza. And that by itself could be a very difficult task to achieve. So uh, uh, right now to divide Israeli efforts to another front, uh, I think most Israelis would, love, would probably not like it, but we have to take into consideration, especially following the recent events in, in, the, in the North, that we might face uh, a miscalculation, we might face further escalation, which nobody really wants, and, and that could itself lead to, uh, to the opening up of, of, of a new front in, in the North. Yeah, I very much agree with that. I think I think you know the the 
slight silver lining to this is between the U.S., Israel, and Iran, all three of them understand that a fully escalated conflict that spread to the Gulf would be a big lose-lose situation. Um, and I, you know, I certainly also the the economic impacts of that in an election year for the U.S. Uh, you know, there there have been a few American hawks who have been chiming in on that, but they really have not resonated much with any of the the political mainstream here in Washington. Um, yeah. See that we have one question that came up. Um, look through this. Um, one uh, question from, yeah. the, from the audience. Um, Iran and its allies assess that Israel's ground forces are significantly less capable than the Air Force and therefore more vulnerable in a ground operation scenario. What do you think of this assessment and how do you interpret the perceived delay in entering Gaza? So I wouldn't say that the ground forces are, are less capable, but certainly the Israeli Air Force is, is considered to be the strategic uh, arm, arm of Israel. And, and let's 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 be honest. Most Israelis, including the Israeli officials, would uh, in in other in any other circumstances would prefer that most of the warfare will be carried out by Israeli Air Force. It's it's much less risky. We don't have to send our troops to Gaza. We we've been many years in Gaza. We, we, we still don't know what kind of surprises expecting us in, in Gaza. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we we will not be able, in my view, to achieve the directive of the Israeli government to to uh, not just to weaken Hamas, but again to make sure that it's not going uh, to to be able to uh, to come up again as as, as a sovereign in Gaza without the use of of, uh, of our troops. And 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 my sense right now is that uh, uh, the, the the current uh, reserves uh, being recruited uh, and being re uh, deployed both in the south and, and in the north will make it very extremely difficult for uh, for Hezbollah or for any other one to try and surprise and, and, and have the same impact uh, we had 11 days ago. I think that if Hezbollah really wanted to uh, to surprise us and, and to, to have a meaningful achievement, it could have joined Hamas 11 days ago. Uh, if it, uh, when it didn't do that, today is probably uh, too late, especially when it comes to, the, to, to dealing with the ground forces. Uh, the, the firepower is, is something uh, something else. Right, and that 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 delay in them doing anything obviously yeah. consistent with your thesis that they're trying to shape the response in Gaza to allow Hamas to survive at some level and not be completely lost. Yeah. So so the, the issue of delay. Uh, I, Again, I'm, I'm not part of the Israeli uh, security uh, um, apparatus right now, so I, I can't really tell what, what is the reason for this delay. My sense is that still Israel tries to uh, make everything which it can in order to weaken Hamas enough between, before the beginning of the ground offensive. Uh, it takes time to do that. We, we, we don't forget, it, this was not Israeli initiative. We, we, were, we were surprised. Uh, we were under shock, so we took at least a week to uh, deploy all these forces, not just in the south, but also also in the north. And then it takes some time to uh, translate, I would say, the, direct, the political directive of the Israeli government uh, to the forces on the ground, telling them, OK, uh, this is the directive. This is what you have to do. Now, how, how, do you, how they are going to do that? And it might take uh, some time. This is a bit a bit off topic uh, for Iran, but let me just throw, throw this out. Um, how do you think the Israeli? How do you think Israel will approach the day after once the military operation ends? Who what what who would Israel like to see governing Gaza a year or two from now? And it's, that's clearly not the Israeli military administration again. But who would that be? Would there be a role for Egypt or other Arabs or? So Greg, this is the one million dollar question, uh, and uh, I thought you you wanted to be optimistic, and and this my answer is go, go, it's probably going to to be more pessimistic. Uh, look, practically there are three main uh, scenarios from what I can see. One is to um, to get into Gaza, um, um, put an end to Hamas rule. And then uh, Israel is to take control back to, to, to the idea. Uh, I think that that's going to be a disaster. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu even said 
uh, that uh, Israel doesn't want to, to control again over 2 million Palestinians in, in Gaza. So I think this is, uh, this is not one scenario which, which uh, uh, will probably uh, happen. The, the second option uh, is that we will do our best to eliminate most of the capabilities of, of Hamas, most of its, its leadership, and then withdraw, perhaps not from 100% of Gaza Strip, perhaps we, we might uh, um, maintain in a, in a quite narrow uh, strip near, near the border, uh, but that means that Gaza might turn out to be uh, another Somalia or another Yemen, uh, because we, we really don't know who is going to, to, uh, um, to get there. The, the, the best scenario for the, for the Israelis would probably be a kind of redesigning the political situation in, in, in Gaza in a way which could, by the way, take years, uh, in which Hamas will be replaced uh, by a kind of coalition uh, of uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, with the support, both the political support and the financial support of the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, perhaps the involvement of the UN, uh, the United States perhaps, uh, Turkey. Uh, the problem with this scenario is that uh, we have to get them agreed to, to do that. And I, 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 my assessment is, is that part of what uh, Blinken has been doing uh, recently in, in recent days is to try and think on the day after, and his visits to Jordan, his visits to Egypt, his visits to Saudi Arabia, are aimed to try and, and, and get some support for a kind of uh, alternative. But uh, I have to admit, it's going to be very difficult to convince all those uh, so-called moderate states, Sunni states, to take control uh, in a situation after Hamas, even if, if, if Israel succeeds to, 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 to make Hamas not disappear, but, uh, uh, but, but, but losing its control in, in Gaza. Yeah. Back on, back on Iran, um, I mean, one question kind of looming in the background, you know, you've had the protest movement that has kind of ebbed away. The government, the clerical regime there seems to be stable for the near term, but you've got the succession coming up. Um, does that looming succession or any of the politics around that impact how they would think about their interests here? Not directly, but I think that uh, uh, the succession issue will certainly have an impact after Khamenei um, leaves the scene. And, and of course, the question is, is always the question of uh, who's going to replace him and what kind of, of, of uh, political uh, order we will see after Khamenei. Because one scenario is that he will be replaced by uh, someone like a brain Raisi, the president, and nothing uh, significantly will, will change. But uh, I, I, I tend to share the, 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 um, the assessment that we will see more involvement and more influence uh, of their IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards. Uh, and the question, of course, is uh, how it will, Im uh, what impact it will have on, uh, not just on the domestic policy of Iran, but mostly on, on its foreign policy. And you know, people sometimes some people have has have the, the view that the IRGC, because they are um, not clerical uh, establishment, might be more pragmatic, more uh, more moderate. I'm not sure this uh, this will too, because we know that the IRGC and especially the the, the younger generation of the IRGC uh, uh, who grew up in Iran during the Iran Iraq War, uh, they even if they are perhaps less committed to to the clerical establishment in Iran, but they're certainly more nationalistic. They certainly consider the West and the United States in a way which is uh, even perhaps more radical than some of the first generation of, of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, so basically, I think that uh, uh, we might see uh, an even more um, hardline uh, policy when it comes to Iran's regional policy and the nuclear policy uh, in in a case the RGT plays a, a major role in, in, in Iran, uh, but but this is still uh, we you know Iranian clerics tend to live longer, so uh, Khamenei could could live a few years more. But but certainly we could we, we can already see how the RGC has played a major role over the last few years when it comes to this um, um, coordination between the different elements within the axis of resistance. By the way, even after Soleimani was killed, uh, the, the, Iran certainly suffered a big blow following Qasem Soleimani's assassination in 2020. 
But I think that it's uh, uh, right now we could say that even if this assassination uh, brought some change to the way Iran deals with the, its partners or proxy or proxies or, or allies, and perhaps Ismail Khani is a little less respected by someone like Nasrallah in comparison to Semani, but still Iran was able to preserve this uh, so-called Iran threat network or Iran proxy network uh, even after Soleimani was uh, was away. Yeah, I would, I would certainly argue myself that it hasn't reestablished deterrence the way that its proponents in Washington um, said that it would. Um, I don't. I don't really see the. I mean. It, 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 it felt good from an American standpoint, given the blood he had on his hands, um, but it, it didn't really accomplish much in my view. Um, you know, moving, moving back to, it sounds like you're not optimistic about political change in the other direction, um, you know, in, in a more liberal. Inside Iran, you mean? Inside Iran. I have to say I'm not optimistic because I, I think, and that was my perception, even without, at the peak of the of the Zanzendegi Azadi, the the the, the, the protests of uh, which erupted last year in Iran. I, I was not optimistic because I, I said then, and I'm still uh, sharing this this idea that we meet. Uh, we didn't have three major components which are, in my view, vital uh, to to take the social. Uh, demographic, cultural trends within Iran and, and, and make them evolve into political change. We didn't have enough uh, people on, uh, on the streets, with all due respect, and everyone in Iran who, who gets to the street and demonstrate against the regime is, 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 is very courageous. But in order to, to have a revolution in Iran, you, you must see millions of Iranians going to the street. That, that was not the case. The second uh, uh, thing which didn't happen was a kind of uh, coalition uh, very similar to that uh, which 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 uh, we saw in Iran before the uh, during the revolution in 78 79 a coalition between different sectors between different segments within the Iranian society working together to bring a, a change it's it's not enough for students or or pupils in, in pupils in, in in schools to go to the streets and with all, with, with the exception of what happened in Baluchistan and Kurdistan, uh, the majority of the protesters in Iran came from, I would say, the, the more uh, educated uh, urban middle class of, of, of the big cities. Uh, uh, and it's essential to bring workers and teachers and bazaaris and clerics and all working together. And last but not least, uh, we didn't see um, cracks or divisions within the political elite and certainly not within the security establishment. Uh, and, and, and eventually the Shah lost his, his rule, uh, not just because of the millions of Iranians in the street, but, but mostly because the Iranian military did not support him. And, and when Mubarak uh, uh, was thrown in the Tahrir revolution, uh, he lost the control, not just because of the millions of Egyptians in the street, but also because the Egyptian army did not support him. And I'm afraid that the IRGC in Iran uh, still understands that if this regime goes away, it will go away together with him. So the IRGC is still very much dependent on, on the clerical establishment in Iran and the Islamic revolution. So as long as we don't see those three elements, more people in the streets, a coalition of forces and cracks within the political and, and, and security establishment in Iran uh, uh, being materialized, I think it will be very, very difficult for, to, to see any kind of, of political change in the in the near future. And I, I tend to agree with that. Um, I mean, the, the RGC has set itself up as, as kind of a separate military caste apart from society with its own businesses, its own financial model. Um, and that's very durable in a way that a regular army like the one the Shah had um, drawn more from the people, so to speak, is not. Um, yeah, they, they have certainly learned the lesson of the, the Shah. Uh, so uh, you know, one, one last kind of broad question. Um, you, know, you mentioned earlier that there are wild cards and ways that this uh, could escalate. What are the things that Iran could do that might uh, provoke Israel enough um, to escalate directly against Iran, if anything? So the the, the most important thing it, it could do, if it want to, if it wants to escalate, it it, it could just engage Hezbollah in a full scale confrontation with Israel. If 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 that happens, we will certainly see 
the widening of, of the war in Gaza to the north as well. And, and that's a, a totally new uh, scenario. Uh, again, I, I, we have to remember that, that Hezbollah has its own interests as well. Uh, Hezbollah, perhaps unlike Iran, has to take into consideration other factors uh, such as the Lebanese uh, uh, public opinion, the opinions of, of the so-called governments in Lebanon, the economic situation in Lebanon, they, they have to take that into consideration. But, but practically, I, I have to say, if, if Khamenei, if Salami, the, the commander of the IRGC, if Khamenei, the commander of the Quds Force, really insists that Hezbollah will be deployed and will be engaged in a full-scale confrontation in Israel, I find it very difficult to believe that Hezbollah will say no. Uh, and that's the main... Uh, uh, um, asset to be used potentially by Iran to escalate things even further. But again, it has a price. And the, the price might be that Iran will have to give up some of the most important strategic uh, uh, assets uh, of Hezbollah. Again, with all due respect to Hamas, Hezbollah is something different. It is much more committed to Iran. Iran is much more committed to, to Hezbollah. Hezbollah is the major Iranian uh, front arm uh, to deter Israel and to retaliate against Israel. Uh, if it loses those capabilities, if, even if that's for, for a matter of years, uh, that might have a, a major impact, not just on Hezbollah, but also on Iran's deterrence vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. So I think they, they will uh, think a lot be before doing that, but they, they might get there. Yeah, I, I, I certainly uh, hope that some of these deterrent forces, self-deterrent forces in that thinking that you, you know, you've described operate for Hezbollah, Iran, and really everyone and help contain this, um, you know, what obviously is still a, uh, you know, horrible situation for Israel to deal with, but it'll be better if it's contained and not spreading. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, you know, thank you again, Roz, for taking the time to join us uh, during this, this very difficult period for Israel. I hope our viewers have found this discussion as enlightening as I did. I'd like to mention that uh, this discussion will be posted on YouTube and the center's website if anyone wants to recommend it or post a link on social media. Uh, thank you, Roz, and that concludes our session. Thank you. Take care.